Welcome to the Golden Age of Cardboard Podcast, where we remember a time when stacks of cards were held together with rubber bands and Mickey Mantles were put in bike spokes. We hope you will enjoy and reminisce as you come along with us as we tell stories about the baseball cards from the Golden Age of Baseball. We will examine the state of the vintage baseball card market and talk to some of the greatest collectors in the hobby. You won't be hearing us talk about any chrome or shiny cards here. Now, to take you on this retrospective journey, here's your host, direct from the shallow end of the gene pool, my son, Mike Moynihan. Yo, and hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast. My name is Mike, Mike Moynihan. I am your host and welcome to the show, everybody. I am doing an episode today that will probably be a groaner for a lot of people, I have to admit. But this is an episode that was born out of a direct communication with somebody that watches the show, listens to the show. His name is Chris. He's in Missouri and he asked me to do this topic. And I was thinking about it, like, do I really want to talk about, you know, storing, organizing and tracking a vintage collection or any collection? It won't matter if it's vintage or not, but I'm going to mainly hit it from a vintage standpoint because there are some things that are a little distinct in collecting vintage versus other things. And I was thinking, God, do I, is that just going to either A, bore the piss out of people? Or B, I thought, you know, I've done plenty of videos about this before, but what was what I thought about as I kept grinding on this was not everybody, nobody, I shouldn't say not everybody, almost nobody goes back and listens to either old episodes of podcasts or binge watches a YouTube channel or whatever. So even though it's a topic that I've felt, feel like I've covered adequately in the past, hey, a little refresher is never a bad thing. And things have, things change over time. Uh, technologies evolve, new things come out. So to revisit this topic is not the worst idea in the world. And since Chris asked me to do it, I thought, you know, there, there's probably some other people that would like some hints on how to do these kinds of things. Let me first start off by saying I am by no means like the expert of all experts when it comes to this, but I am very anal about how I organize and track and, and, you know, store everything in my collection to the point that it's ridiculous. I mean, I've tried all kinds of different boxes and all kinds of different storage systems, all kinds of different tracking methods over the decades that really maybe not that long that it's been going on. I mean, look, we all grew up and a shoebox was our storage and I organized it by teams with rubber bands around each team at the very beginning. So things have come a long way. And at the 15 years or so of the internet and technology and, and different ways to do all this stuff online, then uh, yeah, it keeps evolving. And the way I do it has evolved over time. So as I go through these things and what my thoughts are, please don't take it as gospel. What I would tell you is try different things, see what works for you, for your personality, for your collection. It, it's got to fit. And so what works for me might not necessarily work for you. And that's okay. But I think there are enough tools out there for people to tap into where you can find a solution that would make sense. So again, I'd also love to hear if there's something I missed that I don't talk about for whatever reason, either I just didn't know about it or I forgot or whatever. I have some show notes here to help me make sure I talk about certain things. But if I miss something, you know, feel free to put it in the comments. That'd be great. Uh, of the If it's on YouTube, you can put it in the comments section and other people can learn from that and glean from that. If you're listening on the podcast and you have another idea, I don't have another, I don't have a good idea of how to get a hold of me. Instagram, I guess, uh, at baseball collector Mike is one way to do it. 
But uh, again, by no means do I have all of that figured out, but I have figured out a good way for, for it to work for me. Uh, because not everybody can go out there and, you know, spend all this money and all of that. But let me, let me say this about tracking and organizing and storing any collection. We spend, a, we can spend a lot of money on these things. And a lot of people spend money on boxes and top loaders and magnetics and perfect fit sleeves and grading and you name it, right? so much money is spent on that it's a huge industry in fact during covid right everything was supply chains were all so jacked up you couldn't even get a lot of this stuff but it's really important to store your collection well it's really important to organize your collection well and it's really important to track it because you well i'll go through each of those things and and different ideas so let's talk about storage first by the way today i'm going to be by myself you're just going to hear me and this will probably be a episode that's on the shorter end of the spectrum for golden age of cardboard uh, podcast episodes but who knows i don't know how long it's going to i'm going to talk till i don't have anything else to say and then we'll turn it off and we'll go from there so back to storage i was going to talk about storage obviously the size of your collection matters a lot in what you need to store it and the type of collection that you have, not just how large it is, but if you have a lot of raw cards, then you're going to need things that can hold top loaders and can hold um, raw cards or whatever. And so most likely those types of things can be done on, you know, with five row boxes and you know, shoe boxes, etc. Cardboard can work really well for that stuff because it's stackable. It's easy. Uh, if a top loader gets scratched, you just replace it with another top loader. There's not a whole lot of just overall concern there, overriding concern. If a, if a magnetic gets scratched, you can get another one. So those types of collections, storage methods are, are usually pretty simple in terms of just using cardboard boxes. And I have a ton of cards in cardboard boxes over here in my closet. So it, it's, I, I use that. If you are a graded card collector, then you have other issues because typically they're larger. They don't fit in. I mean, there are cardboard boxes for graded cards, but they're card. Uh, they get really heavy because of the, you know, slabs are just heavier. Uh, on a per capita basis. So you've just got more weight you have to deal with. Cardboard can be flimsy. I haven't found, you know, some of the two row boxes are okay, but I don't like, I've used the single row cardboard boxes for slabs before and did not like them at all. And so I ended up finding a solution where my dad and I built a custom storage case for all of my slabs. And it's, uh, it's right behind my shoulder here. And I call it the beast, affectionately call it the beast. And it holds, you know, 4,000 slabs. So it is perfect for that. But again, not everybody can go out and build their own custom storage case. But there are a lot of cool online. You can go online and on eBay and just search graded card storage case. And you're going to find either there's some wooden cases that are really nice. I have had a couple of those in my time. Those are, those are really nice. I like, I've had the plastic, you know, hard plastic cases, the Pelican cases. I've had several of those during my collecting career and those are really great. So it just really comes down to what you like, what's, you know, and, and there is some aesthetics to it. You got to like what you're looking at. It's got to fit, you know, kind of how you are, but those Pelican cases get super heavy for sure. If they get filled up, depending on how big they are and you know, if you, if you get a lot of cards, it just becomes more and more difficult when you're going to have a stack of what, 12 Pelican cases in your, in your card room or in wherever you store your cards. Uh, yeah, that, that makes it difficult. I'm also blessed that I have a card room. I mean, I'm an entire bedroom in my house dedicated to my collection. Not everybody has that luxury either. And so, you know, you're relegated to a closet or a corner in the bedroom along with all your wife's, you know, knitting materials or 
art craft supplies or whatever that I see that a lot, you know, uh, having a place to put them is, is super important and it's not in your attic. Let's just, let's just end that debate right now. Don't store cards in your attic. If you're they're in your attic, go get them out. Uh, especially if you live in any type of heat, uh, environment where it gets hot and cold and temperature changes, humidity changes, etc. That's not a good idea, but, uh, have a, have a place in the house that's climate controlled. That's always a good idea. I wish I had like, I guess, ideally, like if I had my dream, it would be, I have like an entire building that I, if I was like ultimately wealthy and money was no object, have a building that I own that's dedicated to my card collection that I can lock up and turn into like a vault. I had a period of time where I literally thought about adding a bank vault door to this bedroom to secure it because you, you have to worry about safety and accessibility and things like that. And to me, it's always been trying to balance keeping your collection safe and be, having it accessible. A lot of guys store cards at uh, a safety deposit box at the bank and they'll take their high value cards down there. And I get that. I just, I don't like the idea of not being able to look at my cards whenever I want. And so that's always bothered me, but I get it. I understand why people do that. Um, people, you can have, some people have, you know, safes in their house. And that's another good thing to keep your cards safe and accessible. So storing is just one of those things. What do you use and all that? It's always a moving target. It's probably the best way to put it. I think you're, we're always all trying to figure that out and what works best. And if you have binders and you need, if you have binders, you need shelves to put your binders on. And if you have Z folios or whatever, it doesn't matter. You got to have a place to put all this stuff. And you, again, want it readily accessible and easy to look at. So I think storing is again, just going to be a never ending process trying to figure that out. And when you get too much stuff, where do you move it next and all that? Uh, I'm running out of room in this room and, my wife has threatened me with divorce if I was to pull, pull you know, have stuff outside of this room. So I've got to figure that out. Like, do I, cause I want to keep everything. So what do I do now? So that's storage. Um, and then within your collection, not just storing it properly, but how do you organize it within your collection? There can be so many different ways to do that. I think there are as many different ways to organize a collection as there are different types of collections. <laughs> Because to me, we're all kind of fingerprints and snowflakes. We're all unique. We all like things, uh, a little bit different things within our collections and have different PCs. We might have a section in our collection of things we're planning on selling or duplicates or things that's PC forever, casket cards, etc. And so trying to figure out how to organize that is super important. And for me, the biggest reason organi organization is so important that why I keep things organized is when I want to find a card, I want to know where it is. When you have so many things, the, the physical location of your cards is super important because I'm either putting stuff together. I want to pull certain cards for a video or, you know, oh, I wonder where that card is. I think I have one of those. I want to be able to find it quickly and not have to rummage through countless 5,000 count boxes. That's no fun, no matter who you are. And so I think in maintaining a well-organized collection is super important. Um, again, I, I think everybody just needs to find the way they, they do that. They want to do that. Let's say you're a player collector. Well, do you organize your cards as a player collector by year? Do you organize them by maker, you know, card manufacturer, and then by year, and then, you know, do you have them in serial order number? Like, I mean, who knows? We all, again, will kind of be creative, but it needs to be a way that allows you to find a certain card quickly. With a large part, with the hundreds of thousands of cards that I own, you could say, Mike, do you have an XYZ? And I could, I can either tell you, yes, I do. And if I do, if the answer is yes, then I can probably find it pretty quick. And that just comes from staying organized. Think about when we were kids, right? You're, 
mom would always tell you to clean your room and you're like, oh, I don't want to clean my room. But it, once you get your room clean, it's much easier to keep it clean than to have to start all over a few weeks later. And that's how I feel about card organizing and collection organizing. If I, if I keep it clean in small doses, keep things organized, keep putting things where they need to go for the long term, it makes it much easier. Things don't get backed up, stacked up and just annoying me to death but that's probably more me personality wise than anything but i can't stand to have cards just lying around stacks of cards that don't have that are not in what i would call their home based on the way that i organize my collection so figure that out think about how you want to do it make a conscious effort to have a system have a plan whatever that is and now the last thing I want to talk about is tracking. And this is the part that Chris was asking specifically about and the part of this discussion that I'll spend the most time because tracking itself of a collection has evolved significantly over the last few years. And there's a lot of online tools that we have available to us as collectors. If we want to use, we can, I'm going to share a couple of screens here because well i can if you're online listen to this on the podcast i will uh tell you what i'm looking at the first one here is <coughs> a website that's synonymous with several others and it's called uh the card hedge the website is cardhedger.com just like it sounds cardhedger.com this is a website where you can research, manage, and track your collection. It shows it here. And it's all about, you know, pricing information and putting your cards in there and kind of knowing what your quote unquote cardboard portfolio is worth in any given moment. And I, I think for a lot of collectors that can have some value. Usually if you're a vintage collector, value is an ancillary benefit of what we do. It's not a driver of what we do, but I, I still like kind of knowing, you know, it doesn't necessarily affect a decision in terms of, wow, that card's worth a lot. I'm going to sell it, but it's like, huh, that's pretty interesting that that card has doubled in value since last year or whatever. Uh, that's interesting to know. So I find it interesting it's certainly not a driver of my habits and, and what my decisions are. So card hedge is a, is a, a relatively new tool uh, and in full disclosure, uh, card hedge is just signed on to be a primary sponsor for bench clear media. So we're, you're going to be seeing a lot more of things about the card hedge and cardhedger.com. So that will come later. But there's two others that are main ones. Uh, as I get rid of this, there's card. You got Card Hedge, you've got Market Movers, and you've got Card Ladder. All three of these tools, I think, are in very similar. There's certainly probably some nuance, difference, subtle differences between each one, but they are all trying to allow you to create a portfolio put in what cards you have and or look up cards that you're looking to buy and kind of see what those price movements have been over some period of history. And I think all of them probably have things that are good about them and things that are bad. I wish I could speak more in detail about how those work, but the reality is I've never used any of them. Most of them are pay to play services. So you, pay a subscription fee to have those. And what I would tell you is the biggest reason I haven't done it is, and this is in talking to Card Hedge as we were working out uh, our sponsorship deal with them, that, and they realize this is a problem across the industry of tracking sports card collections, is it's pretty limited. They all have a certain amount of cards in their database that they track. They don't track everything. And so it's, you know, you might have a card that's just not in there. So it's really, really hard. It's like, well, dang it, that's one of my best cards. And they happen to not track it. 
because it's maybe not a it's a one of one or it's a low numbered card that's just not tracked. There's not a lot of data. And there's certainly not a lot of vintage on any of these sites. And so that's a, at least from a card hedge, they've recognized that, hey, we need to do better at this. We need to improve how many different cards and different sets. I think card hedge has, I'm going to say this number, it may not be exactly accurate. It's not intentionally misleading, but 100,000 plus cards that they track, which is a lot, right? But there's literally millions and millions of cards out there. So they, they, they are certainly missing quite a few cards if you want to track a complete collection. And it's usually tracked not at the raw level, but at a graded level. And so to say, to have just an inventory of your collection, if you have a card that's raw, that's a very difficult place to do that, whether it's card hedge, market movers, or card ladder. They're all, that's very difficult for all of them. In the vintage world, there are, and I'm going to make a note to myself because I, I just thought of something and I don't want to forget it. Um, so, because I'm going to talk about another thing right now. And in the vintage world, if you want one of those tracking type softwares, I mean, until somebody proves otherwise, VCP is the king of that, vintage card prices. Uh, and there are plenty of things to complain about VCP. None of these are perfect. That's the whole thing is you have to find one that fits the best with you, knowing as you go into it that it's not going to be perfect and it's not going to do everything that you want it to do, which, you know, kind of blows, but that just is what it is. So I'm going to pull up VCP here. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to, I'll be able to share my screen with you. But vintagecardprices.com is the website. They have an app. They have, and I, and I am a subscriber to this. So uh, just in full disclosure, I, I own a subscription to this. I have paid for a subscription to this and I use it a lot. This is my primary tracking system. And I think a lot of vintage guys use VCP for a lot of reasons. It, it does not have every card either, by the way, but it has way more than everyone else, like way, way more. And if you're a vintage guy, that's a good thing because you might have a card. Here's the issue though with VCP is, and, and true of a lot of them, it's mainly geared towards having a graded card collection. So if you pull up your collection, um, this is just showing mine, uh, all the different cards. And these are all just graded cards that I have in here in the collection. You can, what's cool is you can search by a player. Like this is Bob Feller. I have one, two, three, four different Bob Feller cards uh, in my primary collection. I have it broken down by just my primary slabs, my autographed slabs, and then you can make different subsets. You can do just one set or you can have a little category, subcategory, let's call it for a different subset and easy to search and find cards. So it, to me, it's very easy to use. It shows you kind of what the value is, what you can put in that you have to put in there, what you paid for it. And it can, it tracks up, down, left or right. A lot of complaints I hear from people, especially dealers about VCP is that the card prices are not up to date. Well, I would, I would argue that's not necessarily true. It might be true sometimes, but by and large, when I'm looking up a comp, if I'm at a show and I didn't trying to find a comp for a card and I pull up VCP, look a card up, it's pretty accurate. If there's been a sale recently, it's going to be in there most likely. And I also, I, I do cross-reference it with eBay. Now, VCP uses what's great about their pricing tool and how they value cards is they use eBay. They use all the major auction houses. So they, I think, cast the widest net in terms of trying to identify as many public sales as are out there. When you have a private sale or a deal at a card show, that's not reflected in, in the prices on VCP or anywhere else for that matter. So those uh, exchanges, those transactions are not included anywhere. What another detriment to card hedge, market movers, card ladder is they are limited. Most of them are just pulling VCP data or not VCP data, sorry, eBay data. A couple of them have tied into some auction houses and whatnot, but the reality is 
they haven't quite figured out how to make that work really well yet. But VCP has to a large degree. So I'm telling you, if you're a vintage guy and that's your thing and you have a lot of graded cards, then VCP can be a very productive solution for you. So then what if you're a raw guy? Well, if you collect mainly raw cards, then you've got to find a way to track that still, right? And I would say one place that you could go is Beckett. I mean, Beckett has, for all the issues that, you know, there's reasons a lot of people don't use Beckett anymore in terms of just looking online and pricing tools and whatnot. That used to be the place to go for pricing. And, but it does have a very cool tracking system. So if you want to put that you have certain cards, you can do that and kind of create your, your collection online through Beckett.com. Uh, you have to sign up. Uh, I do believe there is a fee to that. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. And, and I don't want to quote prices here either. Cause if somebody goes back and listens to this a year from now, the prices might've changed. And so I would just tell you, check each website they'll have their current pricing. Uh, typically most of them, it's cheaper to buy it by the year, an annual subscription than on a month to month basis. Most of them have trials where you can try for 30 days and give it a shot to see if it's something you like, if you like the, um, the interface and the interaction and what's available and all of those things, those are all worth, you know, trying out different things to see what suits you best. But at the end of the day, if you cannot find anything online that just makes sense for you or it's too expensive or whatever, I would tell you, go back to the old spreadsheet. Use a spreadsheet, either a Google Doc spreadsheet so that you can have access to it wherever you want or an Excel spreadsheet that you can put online or whatever, put in a, an online drive where you can access it. But if I said, hey, what's what's gotten me through thick and thin in terms of organizing and tracking my collection, it's a good old spreadsheet. So I will never get rid of my spreadsheet. Even if I use other things, I consider those kind of redundant systems like, oh yeah, that's cool that I have a lot, all my slabs in VCP, but at the end of the day, I track it myself on a spreadsheet. And to do that, I'm going to show on, if you're watching on YouTube, I'll be able to show you this. Let me share my screen for that. Uh, I've shown this before several times, so I do feel like I'm being a little redundant in some things that I've said, but the reality is not everybody's seen it. So I just have this giant spreadsheet and I have at the bottom of my spreadsheet, I have everything, every segment of my collection, I break down into a different tab. Now, some parts kind of overlap. Um, like if I have a 52 tops autograph of Bob Feller, you know, that might fit in several different collections. It's a player era autograph. It's a, you know, it's, it's graded. So it's part of my graded autograph collection or whatever. You know, you could have one card fill many slots for different collections that you might have. And I just track them all independently as th this collection has its own tab. This collection has its own tab, etc. And so I like, here's all the complete sets that I have since the dawn of time. Um, so I have a complete set one I have back in, I even have retired collections. Like I still have from when I collected Juan Gonzalez, I have a spreadsheet of all my Juan Gonzalez cards that I used to have before I sold them. Uh, player collections like Pudge. And I, I generally get the information to fill that through, say, Trading Card Database, which, oh, by the way, is another one that you might look at, is Trading Card Database. Uh, that's uh, very popular with a lot of people. I've never actually dived in, or is it dived or dove into? I've never used trading card database, so I can't say that I'm an expert on that or can even give a whole lot of information on that, but I've heard good things about it. Uh, I have my Josh Hamilton collection here that kind of stops in 2014 when I kind of stopped collecting Josh Hamilton uh, player collections of Michael Young. And then I have, like, here's a list of all my one of ones, you know, 
300 plus of them. So I have a list just of all my one of ones, my complete sets, like I said, my biggest things that I'm working on now in terms of projects are some different autograph sets that I'm working on in autograph projects. And then my, of course, five decade set, which you guys have heard me talk about in nauseum, mm -hmm. but I have to have a way to track that. Now, PSA does a great job of allowing me to, they have a bunch of different set registries where you can track things for sure doing that. But I've found it way easier just to have my own list that is catered to what I want to see. Now, you guys can make us, anybody can make a spreadsheet and put any data that they want on it. Some people want to know everything about the card, who the player is, what year, what grade, if it's graded or card number and cost and all kinds of stuff. Uh, I simply want to know, do I have the card or not? And so I keep it very simple. The year and the maker of the card, who's the player, what grade I have it in. And so I do have the weight on here in terms of what weight that card is on the registry. That's a whole nother topic, but I, I simply highlight a card if I have it and I leave it blank if I don't. So like 52 tops I'm looking at right now, I only have four cards in 52 tops for all of the Hall of Famers that I wanna get. Well, that means there's a lot of white spaces and a lot of money that's gonna be spent eventually to get those cards. Uh, then I have years where I, like on 53 Bowman Color, I only need one card, Duke Snyder. So uh, I track that. So all the 50s I have on one tab. And then I have the 60s, 70s, and 80s on another tab. And I track how complete am I on each year. And look, I probably take this way beyond what normal people would need to, to make that work. It's just what works for me. And, and that's a big thing. And then I track my overall progress on the five decade set. Like right now I need uh, 536 more cards to complete it. I'm 77% of the way there. And if, by the way, as an aside, if you would have told me two years ago when I started this whole crazy thing, three years ago, whenever it was that I would be, you know, well over three quarters of the way there in just a couple of years, I'd have thought you were crazy. So um, I track the top 300 cards by Mike Payne, even though that's a set registry and I have it on the set registry, I still track it on my spreadsheet because I, I want to have a place that kind of everything is, even if it's somewhere else. Again, probably overkill, no doubt. I track all of the players that I have autographs of, how many I have. What's great or cool about spreadsheets too is you can sort stuff different ways. You can get all the data in there and you can uh, manipulate the data in a way that allows you to see what you're trying to see. Um, who I have, uh, I mean, I have every Hall of Famer autograph that I have listed out individually and what it is, its description, is it slabbed, is it not, you know, you name it. And that sounds, all of this, as I go through a spreadsheet and probably boring the hell out of everybody, but it's a necessary evil, right? I need to know if I already have a certain card, I need to know so that I don't spend money unnecessarily on something I already have. And all of that plays into my desire to keep things tracked and organized really well. And for people that have a smaller collection, that just may not be as big of an issue for you. But as collections grow, believe me, you forget like, oh, man, I forgot I had that card. You end up buying it again. And you're like, well, that's $10, $20, $100, whatever you spent on that card that could have gone towards something you didn't have. And now you have to resell it if you're going to sell it or keep an extra forever. And you're like, ah, oh, you know, so to avoid as much of that as you can, staying well organized, staying where you're tracking your cards. And again, it's much easier to do in small doses. I would tell people as you try to figure out how you're going to do it, don't just sit there and do a marathon order entry input data input on every card you have into whatever tracking system you decide to go with, but do it in small doses. And if you have questions, try to find somebody that you can ask that you hear you've either heard them talking about it online or, on videos or whatever, you know, don't be afraid to ask other people, Hey, I, I want to do this with this system. How does that work? Do you know how that works? And, and most times somebody else will have encountered the same problem before you and can help navigate 
you to a solution that makes sense. So uh, again, there are so many different ways to do all of these things, storage and organizing and, and tracking. And I hope that some of this has at least sparked you to think about doing it a certain way, or, you know, maybe I need to rethink how I'm doing it, or maybe it's affirmed that, yeah, man, I feel like I'm doing it. I've got all this figured out and I am tracking really well on what works for me and my collection. Ultimately, that's where we all want to get. And I really, I love seeing organized collections. I love seeing card rooms. I love hearing how people are doing it because I don't have a monopoly on good ideas on how to do these things. And I like, I like getting feedback and maybe trying something different. So if you do have any ideas, like I said earlier, feel free to put them down in the comments. I would love to hear your thoughts and that's it. So <laughs> stay tuned for next week for sure. Uh, my goal uh, it's, it's been on the calendar. It was on the calendar last week to do. We had to move it. It's now on the calendar for uh, for next week's episode for me to interview Peter Steinberg, who is the president of SGC, which should be great because it's going to be very different than most interviews he has to do. We're going to talk a little bit probably about the card grading world and SGC in particular, but we're going to get to know Peter hopefully in a way that uh, will be a lot of fun and just talk to him as a collector, not as the owner of a third party grading company or not owner, excuse me, president of a third party grading company. So that should be an episode coming out next week. If for whatever reason that gets bumped, then I'll figure something else out. But I really appreciate everybody watching, everybody listening. Thanks for all the support. I mean, it's been insane. I just love hearing and getting feedback of how people are really enjoying this podcast and I, could, I wouldn't do it without you guys enjoying it. I promise. It, it, I, I do it because I love it. And I do it because I think it is reaching people and people are really enjoying it. And that means the world to me, honestly. So thanks, everybody. Again, have a great rest of your week, a great weekend. And no matter how you track, organize, or sort, or store your cards, keep collecting.